So here we are with uh, video four of chapter eight, centripetal force. In this uh, video, we're going to be looking at what's called the centripetal force and something called a centrifugal force. We're going to be able to learn how to calculate the centripetal force for objects in circular motion and look at ways, hypothetical ways, that we can simulate gravity. So let's get to it. Any force directed toward a fixed center is called a centripetal force. Centripetal, the word centripetal means center seeking or toward the center. So if you whirl an object around on a string, you have to keep pulling on that string, exerting that centripetal force. The string transmits the centripetal force, which pulls the can into a circular path. So any force that results in a circular motion is a centripetal force. That centripetal force can be supplied by a tension in a string, friction from the uh, roads on, on, a, on tires of a car, or even gravitational forces can produce centripetal forces. The moon, for example, is held in an almost circular orbit by gravitational force directed toward the center of the Earth. The orbiting electrons in atoms experience an electrical force toward the central nuclei. Anything that moves in a circular path, then, does so because it's acted upon by a centripetal force. So in each of these examples here, even though that in this one here and this one here, that string provides a, is a tension, that tension results in a centripetal force. In here, we've got friction that results in a centripetal force. Gravitational forces result in a centripetal force. Now, centripetal force depends on the mass tangential speed and radius of curvature of the circularly moving object. Mathematically then, we use this as our, our equation for centripetal force. Notice that here the speed is squared. It's mv squared over r. The speed is squared, so twice the speed will need four times the force. The inverse relationship with the radius of curvature tells us that Half the radial distance requires twice the force. Now, regardless of whatever supplies that centripetal force, whether it be a tension or friction or electrical forces, whatever it is, it keeps that object moving in that circular path. If that force were to disappear suddenly, that object would con continue on in a path tangential to its circular path. So if you're whirling an object around in a circle on a string, okay, it's the tension that provides that centripetal force, but if that string breaks, then the mass will follow a straight line path in the direction it was traveling at the time of the break. It's not going to travel radially around and continue moving in a circular path. It's just going to move in a straight line path from that point. Apply this to driving in a car, right? When a car goes around a corner, the friction between the tires and the road provides the centripetal force that holds the car in that curved path. If that friction is insufficient due to oil or gravel or ice or something, the tire slides sideways and the car fails to make the curve. The car tends to skid tangentially off the road. The centripetal force plays the main role in the operation of a centrifuge in a science lab. A familiar example would be the spinning tub in an automatic washing machine. In its spin cycle, the tub rotates at high speed and produces a centripetal force on the wet clothes, uh, which are forced into a circular path by the inner wall of the tub. The tub exerts great force on the clothes, but the holes in the tub prevent the exertion of the same force on the water in the clothes. The water escapes tangentially out of the holes. So strictly speaking, the, the clothes are forced away from the water. The water is not forced away from the clothes. Just think about that for a minute. Although centripetal force is center-directed, an occupant inside a rotating system seems to experience an outward force. You've experienced this any time you've been uh, going around a curve in a car. It feels as though you're being pulled to the outside of that curve. This apparent outward force is called a centrifugal force. So centrifugal means center fleeing or away from the center. Now, it's a common misconception to believe that a centrifugal force pulls outward on an object being whirled around. If the string, for example, in this example here, if the string holding this whirling object breaks, 
the, the object doesn't move radially uh, outward, but goes off in a straight line tangential path. Let's illustrate this with another example. Suppose you're a passenger in a car that suddenly stops short. You pitch forward because the car stops short. When this occurs, you don't say that something forced you forward, right? In accord with the law of inertia, you pitched forward because of the absence of a force, right? Similarly, if you're in a car that rounds a sharp corner to the left, you tend to pitch outward to the right, not because of some outward or centrifugal force, but because there is no centripetal force holding you in circular motion. Okay, the idea that a centrifugal force bangs you against the car door is a misconception. Sure, you push against the door, but only because the door pushes back on you. That's Newton's third law. So likewise, when you swing like maybe a tin can in a circular path, no force pulls the can outward. The only force acting on it is the string pulling it inward. There is no outward force on the can. Now, suppose there's a ladybug inside the can whirling around, okay? The can presses against the bug's feet and provides the centripetal force that holds it in a circular path. If we neglect gravity, the only force exerted on the ladybug is the can pressing on its feet. From our outside stationary frame of reference then, we see no centrifugal force exerted on the ladybug, just as no centrifugal force banged us against a car door. The centrifugal force effect is caused not by a real force, but by inertia, that tendency of the moving object to follow a straight line path. So that's why we say that the centrifugal force is an apparent outward force that arises when an object is placed in a rotating frame of reference. So let's explore this idea of a rotating frame of reference for a moment. If we stand outside and watch somebody whirling the can overhead in a horizontal circle, we see that the force on the can is centripetal from the string, just as it is on the ladybug inside the can from the normal force. The bottom of the can exerts a force on the ladybug's feet. If we ignore gravity, no other force acts on the ladybug. But as viewed from the inside frame of reference of the revolving can, things appear very different. In the rotating frame of the ladybug, so from the ladybug's perspective, in addition to the force of the can on the ladybug's feet, there is an apparent centrifugal force that is exerted on the ladybug. Centrifugal force in a rotating frame of reference is a force in its own right as real as the pull of gravity. However, there's a fundamental difference. Gravitational force is an interaction between one mass and another. The gravity we experience is our interaction with Earth. But for centri centrifugal force in the rotating frame, no such agent exists. There is no interaction counterpart. Centrifugal force feels like gravity, but with no agent pulling. Nothing produces it. It's a result of rotation. For this reason, uh, we call it an inertial force, or sometimes a fictitious force, an apparent force, and not a real force like gravity or electromagnetic forces or nuclear forces. Nevertheless, to observers who are in a rotating system, like this ladybug, the centrifugal force feels like and is, and is interpreted to be a very real force. And just as gravity is ever-present at Earth's surface, the centrifugal force is ever-present in a rotating system. It's because we can look at this frame of reference from the perspective of the occupant in the, sp in the spinning object that we can do a kind of a thought experiment on simulated gravity. Let's consider maybe like a colony of ladybugs living inside a bicycle tire. We're going to assume that this bicycle tire has plenty of room inside for the ladybugs to move around. Now, if we were to toss that bicycle wheel through the air or we were to drop it from an airplane high, above, high in the sky, the 
ladybugs will be in a weightless condition, like when, like if you were in an, in an elevator and the elevator cable were suddenly to snap. You're in a weightless condition. They float freely while that wheel is in free fall. Now let's spin the wheel around, okay? If we do that, the ladybugs will feel themselves pressed to the outer part of the tire's inner surface. If the wheel is spun at just the right speed then, the ladybugs will experience simulated gravity that will feel like the gravity they are accustomed to. Gravity is simulated by the centrifugal force. The down direction to the ladybugs will be what we would call radially outward, away from the center of the wheel. So if you were to look outside, we say, well, the ladybugs are, are experiencing this centripetal force inward. To the ladybugs, they're experiencing a force that is down to regardless of where they are in that circular path. Now let's imagine, let's extend this to thinking about people living in space, okay? Say we were able to put a colony of people into a space station in space. That space station then, th those people would be lazily rotating in a habitat in space and will be held to the inner surface of that habitat by centrifugal force. The rotating habitats will provide a simulated gravity so that the human body can function normally. The occupants of today's space vehicles, the space station and whatnot, feel weightless because they experience no support force. They're not pressed against a supporting floor by gravity, or they don't experience a centrifugal force due to spinning. Over extended periods, and this can cause a, lot of, a loss of muscle strength and detrimental changes in the body, such as loss of calcium from the bones. Ideally, then, we would have space habitats that could spin, like the ladybug spinning wheel, which would effectively supply a support force and simulate gravity. Structures of small diameter would have to rotate at really high rates to provide a simulated gravitational acceleration of 1g. This 1g is the acceleration that we experience on Earth. Okay, So we can talk about a gravitational pull in terms of what we call g's. 1g would be an acceleration rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, 2g would be two times that. Okay, so let's just get that straight. So to simulate normal Earth gravity at one revolution per minute in our little space station would require a really large structure, one that's about two kilometers in diameter, which is an immense structure compared with uh, today's space vehicles. Centrifugal acceleration is directly proportional to the radial distance from the hub or the axis of rotation um, at the center. So because of this, uh, we can get a variety of G states. Okay, If the structure rotates so that its inhabitants on the inside of the outer edge experience one G, right? then halfway to the axis, they would experience half a G. At the axis itself, they would experience weightlessness, zero G. Of course, a, a space station like this is hypothetical at this point in time. So to compare then centrifugal force and centripetal force, the centripetal force is directed toward the center of a circle. The centrifugal force is directed away from the center. The centripetal force is a real force. Centripetal, the centrifugal force is a pseudo force. It's an apparent force. Uh, the centripetal force is provided by a real interacting force, such as a tension or, or electromagnetic forces or frictional forces. The centrifugal force arises due to the accelerated frame of reference, due to the rotating frame of reference. Uh, centripetal force we could calculate using mv squared over r, and we could also calculate cent centrifugal force using the same thing. Uh, this is an inertial reference frame for centripetal force, which means it's a straight line frame of reference. A centrifugal force is a rotating accelerated frame of reference. So make sure you understand the differences then between the two uh, centripetal force and centrifugal force and be able to calculate that centripetal force. See you in class.